Hello everybody and welcome back to the Gyrocopter Flying Club. Today we're going to look back at landings because they're still a major cause of gyrocopter accidents. I covered the topic in reasonable depth in some of my webinars over a year ago. Here then are the main themes from that webinar. Takeoffs. What are we trying to achieve? Well, the idea with takeoffs, and I and I, I know this sounds a little bit um, simplistic, but the everybody should be thinking takeoffs in the context of trying to clear fifty feet. So, typically, we have a ground roll. This would be either a wheel balancing phase, or uh, you know, either you call it distinctively a wheel balancing phase or you've just you know ended up on the main gear for a short time before you're now in this airspeed build up phase and then we climb away once we've got sufficient airspeed to, to climb away so this whole distance where it says take off distance required that distance required is to clear 50 feet I know it sounds a bit simplistic, but not everybody thinks of it that way, and we'll come to that in a minute. So, takeoffs, what goes wrong? I'm going to rattle through these because we've got some material left to cover, but the things that go wrong in takeoff either over rotation, blade flap, climb out behind the drag curve, or in some people's language, climb out behind the power curve. They run out of runway. They don't deal with the crosswind very well. They lose your control. And that's usually correlated co to something else. So typically they get, they over rotate to the aircraft like this, and then they get some your event, which finishes the whole thing off. Or they're very unlucky and they get an engine failure. And of course, if you get an engine failure, well, you're just unlucky or you're not unlucky because you didn't maintain your engine or you didn't put the right fuel in it and you get everything you deserve, so to speak. So over rotation, auto gyro aircraft or things with a crank keel are more at risk. So things like that American Ranger would be uh, predisposed to over rotation because they obviously, the kinked tail allows that, if I go back to, just to show you what I mean, this kink tail obviously allows a much higher nose attitude uh, during, the during the ground roll or trying to get to a wheel balance than a Magni M16, which has got straight, uh, a completely straight uh, keel. So if you over rotate, it's typically because you've tried or in your mind, you're trying to get to a wheel balance. You're not thinking necessarily as a takeoff as a takeoff. You're thinking of the wheel balance and then wheel balance to takeoff. And in trying to get the wheel balance, the things ended up on the tail. And if you look at, for example, the Cavalon videos on my channel, most of those are over rotated where they sit really on the on the tail then there's a whole bunch of drag that comes on because the angle of attack now is enormous and the thing sits back down and we end up in this what i call cavalon knob so uh that's poor technique basically or you know a, a mindset thing um the other thing that can happen is the, 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 the change in weight. Obviously, when you're a student and you've been flying with an instructor, I'm 85 kilos in a flying suit and a helmet for a, an open aircraft. And you take me out of the aircraft, and obviously that's 85 kilos gone, which is a considerable part, percentage-wise, of the all-up mass. If, on the other hand, you fly with some other people that we could say, they're probably getting on for 100 plus kilos, and that's an even bigger uh, change in weight and balance. And these things are obviously important to think about when you do a student solo. Uh, 
uh, and it's no surprise that I think some of these issues that have been created in the accidents that we've just seen, where they're early solos for students, maybe weight and balance is part of the problem because the aircrafts feel very different once you get rid of, you know, a quarter potentially of the total all up mass. So what's the consequence of over rotation? Well, basically you unstick at a very low airspeed. Why do you unstick at a lower airspeed? Well, because you've got a lot bigger angle of attack. Um, and so therefore the aircraft tries to get airborne at a lower speed, i.e. more angle of attack. Uh, you know, if you think of the lift equation, uh, angle of attack is, well, it's basically angle of attack and speed. So the more angle of attack, the more lift you get at a lower speed until the aircraft stall, but that's a different thing. Uh, and also because these lower speeds unsticks happen without the aerodynamic tailplane working as effectively, you tend to get a bigger yaw reaction. Uh, and actually, if you watch that um, Utah American Ranger accident, you see that he starts to get some punch. Initially, the nose is, is raising quite high. And when he unsticks initially, he definitely gets a yaw and, uh, and roll moment initially. The other thing about being quite nose high is that you can't see quite so well. So you start peering. Um, and also, if you then continue that angle into the climb out, potentially you're climbing out much steeper than, than you might want to. And again, loss of control is possible in all. And of course, I call it Cavalon knowledge. It's a very common thing in Cavalons. One of the problems, of course, is why you're sorting all this out. If you think about our distance required to clear 50 feet, in sorting out all these problems just eats uh, runway. So if we think back to our planning phase that we talked about early on, if you've planned to take off in 500 meters, for example, and during the course of the takeoff, we've spent 200 meters sorting out a problem. Well, now, if we thought we needed 500, now we need 700, and that might not be available to you at the airfield that you've flown to. Next thing is blade flap. Uh, what happens here? Well, basically, that's basically allowing the rotor RPM to decay. Uh, typically, it starts typically because someone's being distraught, the pilot's being distracted, and he's not monitoring the rotor RPM. And it is only recently on modern gyroplanes that you know, a lot of the instructors have started to talk about rotor RPM. There's a great, well, there is some conversation amongst, well, gyroplane pilots, whether, you know, there's an old school view that oh, if everybody's taught to balance on the mains or wheel balance everywhere, then you don't need to look at rotor RPM. And in a way that's true, but the problem is, if we then relate back to, to this and, this is material, i.e. this airfield does have trees at the end and this distance is getting towards the limit of what is possible with our aircraft. If we're not accurate and we need some methodology to make us accurate and consistent, then in some ways, especially with heavier aircraft, it's not so much problems with single seaters because obviously that distance is so much shorter and at the end of the day once you're down to sort of being able to do this in a couple of hundred meters well you know it obviously becomes relatively academic because not you know you're not taking off from football pitches are we but but once we're into distances that normally require four or five hundred meters anyway if you then start taking 700 meters well that can be a completely different airfield and my issue in some ways with well we'll talk about it later actually but anyway the issue with blade flap is fundamentally a failure to monitor rotor rpm and when all of these factory aircraft have got rotor rpm gauges there's no excuse not to monitor so why have the rotor rpms decayed well firstly it's either a big delay or very slow bringing the stick back 
after you've released the pre-rotator. Uh, and that's, you know, early pilot nerves and not really thinking about what they're doing accurately. So they're a bit hesitant. Um, or they're searching in the cockpit for the, the rotor RPM gauge. Again, it goes back to differences training. You look at, you know, where's the rotor RPM gauge on this one? Well, I can tell you it's there. But where's the rotor RPM gauge on this one? It's actually there, but 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 being there isn't being there. And and of course, if you fly that aircraft, I've got no idea where the rotor RPM gauge is in that. And of course, if you haven't done differences training, then neither will the pilot that hasn't done differences training until he's now floating down the runway and he's got absolutely no idea what his rotor RPM is, and then has a problem. So the other issue is people not bringing the stick back at all. That's typically because they've just forgotten, you know, they've just been mentally overloaded uh, or their process. And this is another thing that we'll come on to. Their process has become so complicated. I mean, I fly, I won't name him actually, because he's, he's a super nice guy. But if anyone flies, if anyone's in this forum, and I know there are some people in this, in this uh, forum, that uh, fly in the UK. If you're a student still, because I don't know whether you are students, but if you are, if you go to your airfield next and you see your instructor, and he's one of these instructors with literally, you know, a volume of, of things taped to the inside of the aircraft, you know, different checklists and so on. <laughs> Other word. You know, because these things are not actually that complicated. That, look, there's a process, but for me, all of these things should be committed to, to the to the to the mind. Even <clears throat> and even if they're suggested that they're an aid memoir to the student, that's too much spoon feeding. The student needs to remember these things off by heart, and it's not a difficult thing to do. For example, I can tell you if you're an auto gyro. You'll line up on the runway, you'll have the brake in the hand, the choke will be off because you'll have done that way before. You'll set 2000 engine RPM, press the pre rotate with the stick uh, fully forward, and you'll watch the rotor taco. You don't need to be reading that off a checklist on the inside of the cockpit. And of course, what tends to happen is because people get comfortable writing these huge long lists, these lists then think, Ah, oh, you know what? Why don't we add to the list that we should check that the runway is clear before we get going? Or why don't we add to the list that we should really do another cross check or check that the passenger is OK, blah, blah, blah. And then before you know it, you, you know, you're on to page two of a long list. And all of a sudden, what you find is that you've been so concentrated, for example, on making sure that the passenger is all OK, that you've forgotten to bring the stick back and you've just destroyed the aircraft you know 200 meters after brake release because the blades are flat so this is the problem um the other issue is not seeing the rotor in rpm increase prior to relaxing any back stick it's typical something in magnets where the stick forces are, are, are quite some magnets i mean m24 i hate flying actually they just the, level, the stick force is just ridiculously high. It's unnecessarily high, actually. And, um, you know, some of these guys, are just, they just get weak in the arms because it's hard work holding the stick back. And bear in mind, the Magni have held the stick all the way back um, for a while because part of the pre-rotation process has the stick all the way back. And they just release that back stick just for some physical relief. And... You know, if the rotor RPM isn't, isn't increasing at that point, then the rotor RPM can decay. The other issue, especially because we're getting older, uh, you get a physical limitation. You know, you're trying to get the stick all the way back, but your fat tummy's in the way and you just physically can't get it. Or you're in a tandem aircraft. This can happen. It happened to me, actually. Uh, thankfully, I caught it in time. But, you know, you're flying a tandem aircraft on your own, but you've got an overnight bag on the passenger seat all strapped in. 
and either it's slipped or you've got, you know, you just put too much stuff in. And that's the thing that is uh, restricting the back seat. The other thing actually is in a 2017 Sport, if the rear seat is not fully down, that can really uh, affect the, um, the stick movement. And I don't know whether this in the chat is going to say the same. Stick force and a Magni, I must have. Ha! Bob, I can tell. So, we, so, so I can tell that Bob is at least 69, sorry, 67, and flies a Magni. Yes. No, but the thing is, though, Bob, I, I don't, do you fly an M? You fly an M sixteen or an M twenty four? I don't. I don't know, Bob. But the stick force is just off the chain. It, it is high. It's unnecessarily high, actually. Um, I mean, yeah, you can do it, but but also, um, again, going back to the age thing, you, you can't. You're kind of right, actually. You know, as you get a bit older, you, you you're naturally not as strong as you would be when you're a fit, healthy forty nine year old. Anyway, uh, another thing about why rotor RPMs decay sometimes can just be the fact that the wind's uh, a little bit light and, you know, you don't get the prevailing wind giving you that assistance. Um, you could have left the rotor brake on. Again, that's a bit of an issue with Magni uh, because the rotor brake isn't necessarily the most obvious. It's not the most powerful, actually. I've I've left the rotor brake on with a Magni and uh, wondered what on earth that noise was, and then carried on anyway. More for me. Uh, rotor inertia in a Magni. They've got big old heavy rotors, so what tends to happen is if the rotor RPM does start decaying with a Magni, it takes a lot longer to start to accelerate again. So for your Magni owners, and that's Bob. Uh, then that is um, that can be a problem. <laughs> good banter, Bob. Good banter. So, what was the other problem with takeoffs? Running out of runway. Uh, that's basically poor planning. That is poor, poor, poor planning. For some of you though, and I don't know whether anybody flies an ELA. Some of the data in their pilot operating handbook is just junk. I mean, absolutely junk. Um, they, they need to do something about it because it tells them tells you nothing actually. Um, I haven't got time really now to go through the POH of, a, of an ELA, but if you if you just go on the internet and Google ELA and find a model, you know, I think they do an S7 or something similar or a 7S, uh, and and look for POH. You'll find a PDF and look and try and work out how far or how quickly you could clear 50 feet. And I'm telling you, you'll, you'll not find the data. It's, it's ridiculous. So um, do be aware of those kind of snags. The other snag, we've mentioned the wheel balance error already, but the other one is not using 100% throttle. And I'm gonna cover that um, now because it's a modern phenomenon and, a, well, it's ridiculous. So. Techniques. One of the issues, in my opinion, about, and this is, <sighs> this is where, in some ways, I start to diverge from the, the traditional, you know, gyrocopter experience, Phil Harwood school of thought. For me, one of the problems around some of this is that there is an inconsistency not just in terms of narrative, but in terms of description. And some of the technique in what is basically one of the most fundamental phases of the flight, the takeoff, is evolving too much. So what do I mean? Well, look, this here on the left-hand side of the screen is actually an extract from uh, an AAIB accident report but it describes, sorry, it describes the technique to take off from the 2008 book, How to Fly a New Generation Gyrocopter. And it basically talks about 
pre-rotating, uh, build the rotor speed, do a wheel balance, and then lift off and fly along a few feet above the runway at 70 miles an hour, and then climb out. And then it talks about a performance takeoff used to achieve the shortest possible ground run, which he describes as you'll become lower at a lower forward airspeed. Okay, so that is confused because the CAA published the safety sense leaflet around takeoffs. And they describe a performance takeoff like this, i.e. to clear 50 feet, while they class the other thing as a rough ground takeoff, which would be to use the new generation gyrocopter book of 2008, that would be called a performance takeoff. Like, but then we have even further confusion for those in the UK because this kind of rough ground takeoff is called an advanced takeoff. So you can see that you know, you've just got snags and pitfalls to fall into left, right and centre. Today, and this is, to my knowledge, at least what was being taught in the summer autumn of 2020, the best practice from the same bunch of people, they now talk about power to initial and then lift power. I can tell you, lift power is 100% throttle. It's never anything different. I had a conversation with the instructor that did my reval literally uh, last week about the same, about this very thing, because he follows this doctrine. And one of the things he was saying was, ah, it's the reason we use the word lift power is to help the students so that they don't always get into the air on full power and it makes it easier for them to get to a wheel balance with the initial power and it means that then it's not too aggressive when they finally climb out and i said to him well basically you're releasing to the world and giving a pilot's license to people that fundamentally can't take off to achieve to achieve this to achieve the best performance to clear 50 feet and and he didn't really have an answer to be honest with you and then and then we wonder why people get to their chosen airfield having I mean, passed their pilot's license and think, you know what, I'm going to easily be able to clear those trees because the PO8 says I can get this done in 500 metres. And you can't get it done in 500 metres because guess what? That number in the POH assumes that you're on full power and you've decided you're going to use this lift power. It's just, it's just basics. So that's why a performance takeoff is always to clear 50 feet. That's the number that you're going to get from the POH. If you decide to do anything different, woe be tied if that distance required is marginal at your chosen airfield because you might not make it. That's all I'm going to say.